I think I now have one aim uh, in this presentation, um, to not be a figurative, figurative hassle. Um, <laughs> as I present, I really fear I'm going to fail with this. Um, uh, I'll give it a go. Um, although, thank you, Deborah, as well, for uh, basically allowing me to perform the role of someone who sees the monstrosity of the crankies. It's um, <laughs> a rare thing. Um, okay, uh, in some ways, there, there will be some indirect resonances. Uh, I think between Deborah's talk uh, and mine, even though the style will be very different. Um, I think we're both interested in um, something which is perhaps strange, uh, perhaps monstrous. Um, the thing I'm interested in is uh, neoliberalism. Um, and perhaps we're both interested in something which may appear to, um, although may not, uh, may appear to um, undo or resist our attempts to attune to it. And um, this is, I think, for me, the problem of neoliberalism as a formation. In 1998, uh, Milton Friedman, the economist, reflects with a kind of stridency, a kind of bellicosity, typical of neoliberalism, on what he calls victory in the war of ideas. One sign of victory for Friedman is a change in something curious, something enigmatic, something that we might struggle to attune to, a change in the climate of opinion. He writes, to judge from the climate of opinion, we have won the war of ideas. Everyone, left or right, talks about the virtues of markets, private property, competition and limited government. No doubt the Montpellier society, and I'll come back to that society later, and its many associates around the world deserve some credit for that change in the climate of opinion. But it derives much more from the sheer force of reality, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and so on. Writing ten years earlier, a very different writer with a very different <coughs> tone. Hesitated before sensing a very similar change in climate, a very similar kind of atmospheric change. Uh, Stuart Wall, a uh, Marxist intellectual, writes of what he turns a more hospitable climate for a certain kind of neoliberal idea. He writes, gradually in the more hospitable climate of the 1970s, these seeds begin to bear fruit, seeds of the propagation of a certain version of um, uh, so the style of economic reasoning. First in the learned societies, then the senior common rooms, and finally in informal exchanges between the new, new academics and more sensitive senior civil serv servants. A monetary version of neoclassical economy, economics comes to provide the accepted frame for economic debate. My question in this paper then, or the question in the project, this paper is the first kind of uh, series of reflections on is might what uh, Wendy Larner terms the tenacity of neoliberalism, uh, what Anya Roy terms the seduction of neoliberalism, being part of function of affective conditions. Ambiguous, strange conditions, named by Friedman and Paul, two very different writers, two very different public intellectuals, as a more hospitable climate, or a gradual change in the climate of opinion. Affective conditions whose strangeness, whose odd materiality is sensed by the word climate. Affective conditions that because of that strangeness, because of that perhaps indeterminacy, pose some challenges, I think, to how we think of the practice and relation that is achievement. For what talk of climates and other atmospheric phenomena remind us of is, I think, the non-coherence of the affective present in which neoliberalism is part of, and in which neoliberalism has its tenacity, has its grip. And this is a problem, I think, the problem of the non-coherence of the affective presence is a problem for some of the assumptions embedded in our ideas of attunement. For as Helen Wilson uh, articulated uh, beautifully yesterday, attunement implies a kind of harmonious relation of proximity that results in, or should result in, some kind of accord between things. Some kind of accord between things that are in sync. But how do you have an accord, how do you become in sync with a present that is non-coherent, a present that is made up of multiple, conflicting, resonating <coughs> climates or other kinds of atmospheres? For the one thing that neoliberalism, and the 
one thing that neoliberal affects are not is coherent. So I'll, so I'll argue. So I want to turn then to three very initial scenes from um, what's, what's kind of the, the very early stages of, of the kind of genealogy of the affective conditions for the birth of neoliberal reason. And my aim will be to try and articulate something of the kind of enigmatic coherence of neoliberalism as an affective com complex without reproducing a kind of totalizing logic of the neoliberal, neoliberal formation or repeating a myth that there's a kind of pure, original neoliberal form. And in doing so, and I think this links to Deborah, although, I, as I said, the style will be very different. It will sadly become a style of hassle at times, as I fear. Um, I want to explore styles of achievement that try to keep alive the aspect of presence, complexity, and contradiction. And I want to try and experiment with vocabularies that are better served for situations and scenes that are not thought of as objects or entities, but rather as a series of envelopes. Envelopes that neoliberalism is caught up in and neoliberalism catches through. This does not direct our attention to the kind of excessive and the exorbitant. It directs our attention to the fragility, to a series of falling parts, a series of fragile envelopes held between the formed and the formless. I want to start some years ago with what might be called an atmosphere. And I want to start with a scene that might provide one of the origins for neoliberal reason, provided we use the term origin advisedly to name something like a complex of forces. The scene is a meeting in 1947 in the Swiss mountains, attended by a small number of uh, intellectual exiles, or self-styled intellectual exiles. A small set of believers, to use the um, term uh, one of them used in a memoir. Believers huddled together for warmth on a dark and stormy night. Huddled together for warmth on a dark and stormy night. It's a dark and stormy night because the participants in the meeting, the participants in the founding meeting of the Montpellier Society, describe in their founding statement a shared sense across a series of transnational networks of a crisis of our times, occasioned, to quote from the founding statement, from the constant menace from certain, the development of certain tendencies in policy. The constant menace from certain tendencies in policy. Those tendencies are for the meetings at for the uh, participants in that meeting. Those tendencies are what they perceive to be a series of critiques of liberalism. And the meetings and the Montpellier Society provide an occasion for the reconstruction of, of, liber of liberalism, or the, the initial formation of what we now consider to be neoliberal reason. Where a central condition in the meetings was very simple. Uh, the openness to ideas, the openness to the coexistence, of multiple ideas for the reconstruction of the liberal project. And what unifies across differences in those meetings is this sense of the need for, the desire for, a revival of liberalism and a belief that such a project is necessary and achievable. So we might think of the site of this meeting uh, as a situation where what Foucault terms the inflationary anti-state suspicion that characterises neoliberalism intensifies and from which circulates a fierce belief in the reconstruction of the liberal project. So the meetings are then occasions for the intense formulation of alternatives, alternatives to, to, the, to the menace they see from the development of current tendencies and policies. And key to that formulation is something about how the occasions enable a mode of speech and encounter a kind of privatised strategic elite deliberation that was consensual on the nature of the threat to liberalism, but was, as Milton Friedman reflected on his participant, participation in the meetings, described as storming without ridicule on alternatives, a storming without ridicule atmosphere. Friedman describes it elsewhere as a collegial atmosphere. So what makes neoliberalism a kind of transnational barely coherent formulation uh, is the repetition of these and other similarly kind of affectively charged forums. 
forms which are held in the kind of tension between the feeling of a menace and the reconstruction of alternatives. Uh, another example of this, which I was going to show a clip from, um, uh, is the form of the workshop in the Chicago School of Economics. Now, what, uh, what is key to the work, the workshop is basically uh, uh, an occasion where um, neoliberal uh, economic ideas are tested out. It's a space of testing. And what characterised the workshop um, as, a, as a, a forum was its uh, intensely uh, antagonistic atmosphere amongst participants. Um, and so you have a kind of resonance at the level of feeling between these kind of meetings in the Montpellier Society and the form of the workshop in Chicago. So in other words, under, underpinning and enabling um, kind of uh, uh, agreements at the level of formal doctrine, you have a kind of agreement at the level of style, an agreement at the level of the disposition within which uh, argument is conducted. So there's something, in other words, about the repetition of various atmospheres as in these key kind of like sites of the formation of neoliberal reason. But we have to be careful here about causation, about thinking about causation in terms of the relation between the repetition of these particular kind of atmospheres and the formation of this thing of neoliberalism. Um, as is known from work on affect, um, an atmosphere may condition, uh, but it rarely or is unlikely to do through a form of kind of efficient causality where a single effect follows from a single cause in a linear, ultimately predictable manner. Perhaps we can say that the atmosphere at these and other sites is a particular form of enveloping, has a kind of emergent causality, one re retrospectively revealed in its effects. But still, we might say that such atmospheres, the openness of the meetings of the Montpellier Society, the critical atmosphere of the Chicago workshops, and they're given various other names and memoirs and accounts, I can say more about that, is what distinguishes the sites of neoliberal formation. But I think this first scene leads to some first challenges in how we think about attunement. Because if one thing that attunement um, kind of presumes as kind of value in practice um, is the sharing of something, uh, kind of a sharing through a certain kind of practice of proximity, and that practice of proximity is a certain kind of entry into relationality with the phenomenon. Uh, it presumes, I think, that something can and is shared across otherwise incremental differences. But my kind of problem, and a lot of what I'm going to do today is to pose problem, my problem in the kind of wider technological pro project is how do you attune to these traces of fragile atmospheres that are both already departed but already translated into other kind of traces. So when you hear the memoirs of people who went through the Chicago School of Economics, what you hear is kind of like an incredible uh, excitement when talking about the competitive atmosphere of the workshops. But how to attune to, to, to that kind of like translation of atmosphere into a, into a bodily trace. So how do you share <coughs> your attempt to, you, the thing you're sharing with is uh, non-present? Scene two. Returning to Friedman and Hall, uh, kind of very unlikely pair of both of them remind us, I think, of something like a second kind of affective condition for the circulation of neoliberal reason. Something vague, something ambiguous, something that might be called a climate, or after Raymond Williams, a structure of feeling, a kind of uh, indeterminate set of pressures and limits. So if the first kind of affective condition I was interested in was the atmosphere of particular sites, the second is the kind of amorphous distributed structures of feeling that emerge and form. So how might something like a climate condition the encounters? Structures of feeling are, are kind of odd things. They're never self-evidently present as such, as we may assume other economic conditions say, or political conditions are, let's say. Structures of feeling are always in the midst of encounters, emerging, changing as they mediate life, shaping how the world is disclosed, related to and felt. We could say something like a climate, something like a structure of feeling, kind of subtends diverse domains of life, kind of works across them, draws them into relation, bestows upon them what would be Thomas, um, before our terrible pronunciation, brilliant one, um, terms an enigmatic coherence across differences. But because a structure of feeling is a kind of system of pressures and limits, uh, it can only speak circumstantially. While hinting, perhaps no more, how people are anchored 
in particular kind of affective words. So the second scene for thinking about neoliberalism and affective conditions are some of the moods that pressured, pressured and limited the iteration of neoliberalism that took the name Thatcherism. These moods don't add up to a totality that could be exhausted, that could exhaust what could be said in 1970s Britain or any other affective presence. Their coherence is better, the kind of disjunctive synthesis, uh, always taking provisional form as they fold with and uh, give a kind of tone to, the, to a particular iteration of neoliberalism. Conditions of Thatcherism. In an essay that launched the word Thatcherism into political vocabulary, was generally credited to have done, Stuart Hall tracks what he terms a shift in popular mood, a swing to the right, <coughs> that expressed, and it is, it is a complicated kind of articulation here, expressed a kind of retraction of the post-war social democratic promise, um, and then that kind of structure of feeling, in the midst of a translation of neoliberal reason into a particular kind of political project. Paul and colleagues, um, here I'm summarising a range of work, well, kind of rereading actually, a range of work, describing affective terms, a kind of cluster of crises within which a varied neoliberal reason took hold. He touches on the violence of the appearance of the Red Scare at the time in relation to miners and other enemies within it. He describes the middle classes at the time in a kind of state of irritable, Thatcher-like arousal. <coughs> At the same time, for Hall, the crisis comes to be organised around what he terms a collective conspiratorial paranoia that the British way of life is threatened from within. In this climate of something like emergency, something like climate, an exceptional state flourishes, so Hall argues buoyed by what he terms an authoritarian mood. This isn't his intention, it's not the intention of his co-writers. But Hall and contributors remind us that neoliberal reason happens in the midst of coexisting, smudged, blurred structures of feeling that enter into a loose relation rather than tight homology with the thing that is neoliberal, neoliberalism. And others were hinted at in my discussion of the Montpellier Society earlier, the background climate there being a sense of menace, a sense of crisis. Now what matters here is less the names given to these various structures of feelings, and more the, more the iteration of them, the resonance between them, the accumulation of them, into, the, into a kind of non-coherent, affective presence. So in addition to the cluster of structures of feeling noted above, the particular translation that is Thatcherism is inseparable from a particular dynamic of anxiety. A particular dynamic of anxiety. So where an anxiety attaches to, sticks to, various other objects and scenes. Anxiety never um, ends, it always moves between different objects and scenes um, in this account of conditions for Thatcherism. So anxiety will attach to particular racialized figures and then move on to another racialized figure. Anxiety intensifies and attaches before moving again. So take race, it's articulated by all of them. The fears about race are not explicated by a succession of panics by blacks, but categorized by power rhetoric, look like Enoch Powell, or calmed by tougher and tougher measures. Up they rise again. And this is what I'm interested in here. It's not necessarily the attachment to particular um, scenes and objects and figures. Um, it's, it's the dynamic they describe of the, of the constant attachment and then reattachment. This kind of movement of anxiety, <coughs> and therefore drawing together of different figures into a certain kind of uh, racialized formation. But what's also described in literature at the time, and emerging from this kind of like overlap and convergence of different panics, um, is the intensification of a sense of what Hall terms a multifaceted and one enemy that becomes the counterpoint to the white class British people that Thatcher articulates as central to her political project. So it's a kind of double structure of feeling. It's the attachments of anxieties to particular figures, but it's also the resonance of those anxieties into a sense of one enemy. 
And this provides, I think, one of the kind of affective conditions for the authoritarian pole um, that was critical to Thatcher's articulation of neoliberalism. So what Hall et al. do, I think, provides them as a sense of kind of interlocking crises, lived through multiple overlapping structures of feeling that condition without determining the formation that is Thatcherism. And they provide something like an affective condition for the double relation with the state um, that characterised Thatcherism. Now, if neoliberalism is generally considered to be animated by a kind of anti-state sentiment, um, even though the relation neoliberalism has with the state, as we know, is multiple and kind of more ambivalent than that, um, what, what's kind of interesting about Thatcherism as one iteration is this doubled relation to the state. So, on the one hand, the relation to the state is animated by this authoritarian mood. It's the law and order state. Uh, the law and order state supposedly necessary in times of emergency. But the flip side, or the, or the kind of like the accompaniment to this anti state sentiment, um, is um, an, an intense critique of the state that is a particular articulation of the anti state sentiment of neoliberalism. So in an essay, again, on the shift to the right, Hall diagnoses what he terms an anti-state mood. There was one way in which the disintegration of the kind of post-war social democratic uh, consensus was felt. Um, and in the backdrop to this, there's a whole narrative about the withdrawal of the kind of cluster of promises that get attached to um, the social democratic state. <clears throat> so the basis for this uh, intense anti-state sentiment um, is the critique of uh, the social democratic corporatist state. Um, and that critique gets refracted through the conjunction of crisis, but also a particular kind of everyday experience, so Hall argues. Hall argues that uh, so, social democratic corporate state was massively present in everyday life, but also used increasingly to discipline and limit police, the very classes it claimed to represent. But what this produces, what we might term after the work of Keith Woodward and John Pitt, a particular kind of state affect particular way in which the state is felt and kind of resonates in everyday life, perhaps. So Hall writes, and this is the basis of this anti-state mood, whether in the growing doll queues or in the waiting rooms of an overburdened National Health Service or suffering the indignities of social security, the corporate state is increasingly experienced by them, not as a benefit, but as a powerful bureaucratic imposition on the people. The result, perhaps, note the condition, is something like an anti-state structure of feeling, the pressures and limits, limits, bestows kind of enigmatic coherence on how the state comes to be felt. The state of social democratic corporatism is no longer felt as neutral, benevolent, even if it was perhaps only felt in that way for certain classes of people. It's instead felt as imposition, present through the alienating affects of bureaucracy. The result is these different structures of feeling resonate together. The state comes to be felt and disclosed as the enemy of the British people. Signs and symptoms of crisis are retrospectively attached to the state. The state becomes the cause of a sense of turbulence, a sense of imminent reversal, a sense of disintegration. All right. It's the state which has overborrowed and overspent, fueled inflation, fooled the people into thinking there would be always, always be more where the last handout came from. Above all, interfere, meddle, intervene, instructed, direct, against the essence, the genes of the British people. So what Hall shows in the articulation of a particular version of the illiberal reason with an anti-state mood that perhaps resulted in a shift rightward across multiple domains, education, welfare, etc., as part of a crisis of 1970s social democratic corporatism. We get a sense here of how crisis is lived affectively, through the kind of intensifications of anxieties, as described earlier, but also how crisis itself, the sense of kind of the overturn and the undermining of something valued, exists as structured feeling. The state is felt as cause of the disintegration of Marx's crisis. 
So the articulation of neoliberalism, uh, the whole name Thatcherism, and there will be many other articulations in relation to multiple partially connected structures of feeling. This is one articulation. As conditioned by structures of feeling that mark a point of transition from the social democratic state, as well as resonating with a series of emergent structures of feeling and inner shift right. So Hall and uh, this is a reread of his work, it's not his terms. It can be read as exemplifying a way of discerning the kind of jumble of structures of feeling, dominant and emergent, heavy and light, that conditions how neoliberalism precipitates. But I think this leads me to a second kind of problem of attunement. If the first problem is how do you attune to something that you can't share or where sharing and the particular entry into relationality that is presumed by sharing was the first kind of problematic. This one is slightly different. How do you attune to an affective present in which something exists as a tangle of kind of elements in the solution. And so it lacks some of the coherence that even in some of the kind of vital materialist work, I still think um, we presume that our objects of attunement have. But I think there's still a kind of presumption of attunement. The structures of feelings named and have deliberately given multiple names to them are kind of hybrids, composed of elements in the solution. They can reactivate, perhaps dormant, now residual affective qualities. So many of the structures of feelings described uh, are folded into the retraction of the social democratic promise, the kind of lingering sense of various becoming dormant structures of feeling, how to achieve to those. Scene three, the tones of neoliberal reason. So, so far I've articulated two fragile, diffuse sets of affective conditions, perpetually coming to form. Atmospheres, Structures of feeling. Sometimes these conditions might kind of intensify together to provide a sense of the weight of neoliberalism, to provide a sense of the momentum of neoliberalism. But at other times, there may be a barely felt background that only touches lightly lives as they are lived. What this emphasis, though, on these two affective conditions opens up is a third connected but not quite equivalent condition. Uh, what I'm kind of calling the tone of neoliberal objects, by which I mean the tone of policies, programs, projects that, that, that uh, involve the instantiation of neoliberalism into particular kinds of projects. Uh, and I think policies, programs, and so on have something like a tone, something like a kind of affective bearing, something like a kind of general disposition and orientation to the world. One example of this, let's turn to Foucault's comments on state phobia as one example of a tone that crosses between iterations of neoliberal reason. State phobia, uh, the kind of anti state sentiment, uh, is described by Foucault as a kind of inflationary process of anti state suspicion, whereby any iteration of the state is disqualified by reference to the worst that the state could become. So any iteration of the state is already disqualified in a kind of paranoid relation that articulates always the worst a state intervention could become. Foucault writes uh, in the Birth of Biopolitics, uh, this critique of the state, of its intrinsic and irre irrepressible dynamism, and of its intellect and forms that call on each other, mutually support each other, and reciprocally engender each other, is effectively completely and already very clearly formulated in the years 1930-1945. So what you find, Foucault argues, across different iterations of neoliberalism is something like a tone that animates both policies and programs. A tone of the critique of the polymorphous, om omnipresent, and all-powerful state. Um, and Foucault describes really brilliantly, I think, about, the, about how there's a particular kind of paranoid relation where anything that the state does is already always disqualified by reference to the future bad or the future worst the state could become. So it's an anticipatory disqualification of any state presence in everyday life. So as I said earlier, neoliberal relations with the state are multiple and ambivalent. Um, uh, principally because kind of markets must be constructed, relations of competition must be constructed. It's a kind of constructionist project, neoliberalism. Um, but what Foucault allows us to think here is how the tone of political reason and the relationship between the tone 
um, qualified here as a paranoid relation, and the opening up of something like a problem space for government. So it's in the context of this of a particular kind of anti-state tone that, that various kind of fields of government intervention are problematized differently. In other words, how do you, how do you ensure that the state acts in a way which isn't going to result in the worst the state can become? In other words, withdraw the state. So we might think how neoliberal policies, programs, projects um, gain and retain momentum in the midst of a whole series, a whole cluster of shifts in the tones of other objects. So one example of this, the extension of relations of competition that are seen to characterise neoliberalism, um, whether through marketisation, privatisation and so on and so forth, um, is accompanied by and enabled by the making of promises um, and the offering of hopes as part of a broad redistribution of hope from the state. Rather than a completely closed future, rather than the kind of like no alternative future. Um, how neoliberalism functions, I think, is by the attachment of promise to neoliberal solutions. Um, and by stretching the present into a whole series of neoliberalised futures, and the success of which we demonstrated elsewhere. One of the things I'm going to do in future work is understand the attachment of promises to neoliberal solutions and the ways in which promises mobilise resource. Of course, for many, the promises and hopes of neoliberal solutions have already fallen apart, been disrupted, or were never present. Hopes may be weak, fragile, on the verge of or shadowed by disappointment, so lacking the kind of strength and stridency of utopia. One example of this, of a redistribution of hope from the state and the attachment of promises to solutions, uh, is in the context of how Thatcherism attached the kind of weak hope of social mobility to housing market participation in the context of that loss of hope in collective social democratic structures um, that I spoke about earlier in terms of the crisis of the social democratic state and the retraction of the promises of that state. <coughs> so we can understand factualism in part as a kind of project of redistribution of hope. Um, redistribution which accompanies the extension of relations of competition. And of course, to fold back into the last series of affective conditions I was describing, it's partly through structures of feeling, or other clusters of structures of feeling, that the kind of hopes and fears, promises and threats that accompany neoliberal objects are related to, become part of everyday life. So think of the work of uh, Mark Fisher on capitalist realism as one structure of feeling within which, um, the, within which hope is now distributed. Uh, so, what Mark Fisher describes with the idea of capitalist realism is a sense of capitalism's inevitability and the accompanying loss of other sources of hope. Uh, now, importantly, um, Fisher describes capitalist realism as a kind of pragmatic adjustment <coughs> to the um, withdrawal of hope from other collective solutions. It's a pragmatic adjustment that for him involves resignation, fatalism, acquiescence, apathy, a whole series of ambivalent relations with this thing which is neoliberalism, rather than simply enthusiastic endorsement. So, so in other words, what Fisher is saying, in the context of the structure of feeling of capitalist realism, you don't need to produce neoliberal entrepreneurial subjects. That's not how the neoliberal formation works. Neoliberal formation works through all these ambivalent affective relations in the context of this broad reorganisation of hope. So one of the things I'm going to be interested in future work is with working out the ways in which kind of the hopes attached to neoliberal solutions fold into these kind of other ambivalent affective relations. In other words, when, if at all, are kind of neoliberal solutions based on endorsement uh, of various intensities, often with ambivalence, perhaps only, perhaps with resignation. But when, in other words, do hopes intensify, when do hopes circulate through the networks of neoliberalism and re realism? For one, I think, amazing example of this, uh, uh, consider Lauren Ballant's diagnosis of the US as what she terms a crisis present. Uh, now, what characterizes Ballant is, Ballant's work is um, the US as a crisis present is saturated with what she terms conventional good life fantasies uh, that promise or, or, or um, offer the promise of just a little stability in which scenes within scenes of neoliberal restructuring. 
But these conventional good life fantasies are frayed. Um, they're, they're becoming difficult things to hold on to for Balant. And so what she's interested in is the space of this frame, like how do people adjust to the frame of promises that previously sustained them. Uh, now, in the terms of how I was described in the previous section, we can think here of a series of different structures of feeling that make up the sense of crisis present, um, which perhaps uh, complexify this kind of sense of the withdrawal of the social democratic front. Um, so, a kind of something like the affect of the dissolution of promises uh, coexists with what we might term a uh, widespread sense after Berlant of material and sensual fragilities and unpredictabilities of life. So, mixing together, merging together, the sense of the dissolution of promises and the sense of fragility kind of resonate together with other named and as yet unnamed structures of feeling to provide something like a kind of transitional moment, a moment within which the distribution and redistribution of hopes that neoliberalism uh, animates neoliberalism happens within. In conclusion, all I've tried to do here is pre present a, a few scenes from a very kind of early work on, the, on, as I said, the genealogy of neoliberal reasons, kind of affective conditions for it. And what I'm trying to do here is understand or, or attempt to move towards an understanding of neoliberalism's affective conditions. The kind of the atmospheres, the envelope of formation of neoliberal reason. The structures of feeling that are always blurred, merged, resonating with one another, but they fold into particular iterations of neoliberalism. The tones, thirdly, that animate neoliberal ideas as they circulate. The promises that get attached to neoliberal solutions in the midst of various structures of feeling. So in other words, um, I've not been interested here in the kind of the making of neoliberal subjects. I very radically think that is not how neoliberalism works. Um, uh, I'm not interested in uh, what Naomi Klein has kind of described as kind of catastrophic shock um, and in terms of her work on the shock doctrine. Catastrophic shock as the kind of ground for neoliberalism project. Instead I've tried to think of neoliberal reason kind of moving, working, in a series of kind of fragile affective envelopes, a series of fragile atmospheres and structures of feelings that are never unified, never add up to a totality, never provide something coherent, always come into form, always become forms. Which leads me to my kind of final question, or final kind of thing I'm struggling with. How do you attune to conditions that are never settled, are never clear, are never identifiable, and never, never only attributable to neoliberalism as a kind of pure form. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mark. I have a quick, I'm quite formulated question for you. Um, uh, really sympathetic to what you're, what you're doing, you know, uh, uh, and the mood to thinking about understanding neoliberalism in terms of structures of feeling, or maybe say structures of experience, rather than just the production of subjects. Mm. That's really important and interesting. Um, a discomfort or a question um, is about the critical purchase of what you're doing. Um, so, so you frame what you're doing in terms of genealogy. We'll come back to that in a minute. So you frame what you're doing in terms of genealogy. You're recruiting Stuart Hall into that project and then you're taking Stuart Hall's reflections on the cultures of neoliberalism. As we put it. Um, and kind of recruiting that into redescribing that as a uh, kind of diagnosis of, 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 of structures of feelings. But of course, Stuart Hall's project was, was very clearly within a Marxist critical project, where that description of culture is a description of false consciousness, so of ideology. I mean, Stuart Hall does that in a very subtle and Way, but the but the critical purchase there is that by understanding the ways in which culture is playing upon our emotions is freeing us from that play somehow. The kind of classic sort of the cultural studies school approach. The genealogical approach is quite different to that. Um, genealogy in uh, ge genealogy is about using showing the history of something. To undermine its, undermine its kind of effective purchase or its power. Um, and that 
it is articulated you know, by Nietzsche in the context of questioning values that gain their value, that gain their force through a sense of their in-home, um, their permanence, that these were always, that these were always true. Um, so then to show that they're historical undermines that truth, undermines their power. And in Arendt and the Foucault, that genealogical project's taken up in relation to uh, a modernist um, epistemology which is based on an idea of nature. So again, on a kind of idea of that these things are natural. The, the naturalness of race, is quest the naturalness of sexuality is questioned by and undermined by showing its historicity. When it comes to neoliberalism, neoliberalism, neoliberalism's truths don't work by virtue of having always been true. Um, neoliberalism is this very, very evidently, very deliberately destructivist kind of epistemology to show that it's constructed, therefore doesn't undermine its thought. Your, <coughs> the, the theme of fragility um, I think is really important when you point to Berlant talking about fragility. Um, fragility as a context of, of, of called optimism. Fragility as the experience of being fragile is something that constitutes this world of feeling in which we're, which we're being constituted. I was um, thinking also of Philip Goodchild who kind of tries to do and in some sense, it's something quite similar by thinking about things as theology and trying to do a theology of capitalism and a theology of neoliberalism. And then he really points to how, um, when he's talking about the crisis and you know why the crisis seems to have only enhanced the strength of neoliberalism and sort of undermined it, he talks about uh, that it's the very fragility of the system, its incomprehensibility, the fact that nobody can comprehend it, and the fact that it could all fall apart that fragility that holds us in its grip. So fragility is actually central to the power, the effective power, the emotional power, the authority of the neoliberal construct. Um, what then, how, what's the critical purpose of, of uh, the genealogical project showing its fragility? Mm -hmm. um, okay, I mean, it's interesting. My first kind of, first problem I was interested in the context of this project was um, precisely the question of persistence post the financial crisis. Um, so, kind of in, in, in the midst of what, for a moment, was a kind of interruption to the kind of like left melancholia about kind of change at a certain juncture. Um, nevertheless, neoliberalism persisted, and so basically, what I'm, what I'm kind of interested in is how do we understand how, how do we understand the persistence of something without presuming something persists because it's coherent. Um, but how do we, but at the same time, um, I was always really unconvinced that located the um, reason for persistence in the <coughs> incomprehension of the system itself. So the, kind of the argument that the financial crisis um, was almost a kind of, like a, an, an unachievable object in its kind, in, in, or kind of financial capitalism because of the kind of, um, inhumanness of its various flows and circulations means that it's beyond comprehension. Therefore, there's something about that being beyond comprehension to be subsistent. Um, in, and I'm also, I was also really sceptical about the argument that persistence follows from, and I'll get to the genealogical point in, in a second, um, that persistence follows from that kind of neoliberal subjects have been produced who, who kind of act, who conduct themselves in accordance with uh, kind of the accordance with the system, effectively. I was also sure of that. So I was kind of interested, like, how then do you think of the systems? And so, what it became, while keeping hold of the incoherence, keeping hold of fragility. And for me, the different, the, the ways in which these different affective conditions are once neoliberal and not neoliberal at the same time um, are precisely things which mean, means neoliberalism doesn't necessarily become fragile, fragile but it becomes actually indistinct. Um, Offered, I think, the beginnings of a kind of a counter persistence. You know, because what's persistent is not neoliberalism as such, not neoliberalism in itself. What's persistent is the kind of envelopes within which neoliberal, neoliberal reason is formed and circulates. Now, how does this link then to question genealogy? Um, I, think you're, I think what you're absolutely right about is showing the impermanence, showing the contingency of things. It's like we presume this is kind of like the critical gesture per se. 
and I don't think it is anymore. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right that kind of showing that things are constructed is, is kind of no longer a kind of critical gesture. I don't think that's why I'm using genealogy. Um, why I'm using gene, why, why I'm kind of using genealogy is because genealogy for me is, is a is a is a thought of and a thinking of events, um, uh, or, or thought of and thinking of kind of um, bifurcation points, um, bifurcation points which which in which things kind of like may intensify and solidify, but at the same time in which things may kind of fork and grow. Um, there's, there's a Foucault uses, I think it's in the talks about genealogy being about reconstructing a labyrinthian line. Um, so it's not a line of kind of like descent, it's not a, it's not a straight line, a straight kind of historical line of continuity. It's a labyrinthian line of kind of forkings and bifurcation points. Now, why I think this is interesting in terms of thinking about affective conditions um, is not necessarily to show their, their um, not, not only show their imperm impermanence, but to, but to think conditions di um, in terms of their dynamism. Which isn't the same as impermanence, I don't think. So to think, think about this is why what I was interested in the Stuart Hall reading was the ways in which it was the intensification of anxiety and the movements of anxiety. It's about thinking about the dynamism of the of the condition. And I think that's what genealogy enables me to do, to think the dynamism of the condition, not necessarily the impermanence of, of kind of that people feel in this way or that way. To turn this into Stuart Hall, I mean you're you're right that effectively what I'm doing is 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 at a disjuncture from Stuart Hall's project. Um, however, um, I think what, what kind of, like, what, what I really like in Stuart Hall's work, and we really learned about it, it's kind of incredible. Like, what I like about it is um, like his constant attempt to kind of like find a way of being in the textures of everyday life without kind of, like, without judging kind of like how people adjust to the situations they find themselves in. I think that's what I like about the land as well in her work. So I don't really recognise that account of Stuart Hall in terms of I think he's doing something very different to that false consciousness account actually. Um, uh, very different. I, I think he's I think he's struggling to provide a vocabulary that takes seriously the, the investments and the attachments people have kind of in the sphere of the popular. Um, and doing that in a way which which uh, suspends judgment of the ways in which people can make worlds for themselves in that context, but 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 with but, but his, his his act of judgment occurs kind of like at, a, at a different level of the formation, um, and that's kind of so that's why I think there's a kind of compatibility between kind of like an account of ge genealogy is about for me the di thinking the dynamism of the conditions as genealogy is a kind of event of thought. I think there's a kind of compatibility with that and what I see Stuart Hall doing. Even though I do recognise that what I'm doing, and in, in, in the longer version, I, I, that, that is written in. Um, perhaps not as much as it should be, actually. Um, but I think you're right to push it in.